great. So yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna do a reading and we'll we'll see how this goes and I hope it goes well and but if not, uh, you guys are family and I know you'll be merciful to me. Uh, so thank you. This is the second chapter of the book and it's called right now it's called a difficult fast. Uh, just to set the scene, this is the summer of 2004. I had just spent that summer um, mobilizing a prayer network in the city of Santa Fe, which was the first time God had spoken to me and I had done something that he said, and it had actually worked. And so I had visited 50 churches that summer. We had gotten 39 of them involved in this prayer network, praying for one another. And um, I was like, wow, this is incredible. Um, so that, that was called the Santa Fe prayer net. And, um, anyway, this is the, this is the story of how I got the 10 days vision and I'll just start reading the Santa Fe prayer net was a revelation. I had heard from God. I had stepped out in faith to do what God said. And now it was actually happening. God had showed me a vision. I had done it. And now it was a reality. Realizing that some maintenance work would be needed to carry on the prayer net, Cassie and I decided to stay in Santa Fe for another year rather than go to seminary as we had initially planned. However, my joy was mixed with the realization of just how challenging it was to do things in unity. I attended a number of churches that were part of the prayer net only to realize they weren't actually praying for other churches. It was obvious that many churches either hadn't understood or else had no intention on following through on their commitments. As I now know well, inertia in organizations makes it hard to add one more thing. Local church leaders would sometimes lash out at me uh, with angry and hurtful comments. However, I kept a prayer list of the 39 churches that had said yes. I had a hard copy of their names, their leaders, and their prayer requests that I'd pray over almost every day. Those pieces of paper got pretty worn out by the end. Um, in the midst of all this, it dawned on me. I work for God. For years, I had wondered what I would do when I grew up. I had finally figured it out, and it was following Jesus, listening to him, and starting new things. Following the Lord was challenging, exhilarating, terrifying, liberating, and satisfying. Why would I ever want to do anything else? But I did have a question. How does someone who works for God figure out what to do next? I had completed what I had seen in my mind uh, after my journey across the Western United States. Now, how would I figure out what was next? As I searched the scriptures with this question in mind, I came across Daniel chapter 10. In this passage, Daniel eats no pleasant food, no meat, no wine for three weeks. After the 21 days are finished, Daniel has an encounter with an angel that brings him revelation about the end of the age. Daniel worked for God like me, I reasoned guilelessly. And so why not try what Daniel did? As I entered into this season of fasting in late August, 2004, I had two questions for God. What do you want me to do next? And how can I be part of seeing Jesus get the answer to his prayer in John 17? Seeing the answer to Jesus' prayer had become solidified in my heart as my deepest and best desire. I knew it was a central part of my calling from the Lord. Most Christians that I spoke to didn't think Jesus' prayer would ever be answered. It was this incredible secret hiding in plain sight right there in the Bible. But I knew, and I was asking God, my new boss, what the next step was towards its fulfillment. You are the problem. Coming off an amazing summer that combined new levels of personal intimacy with God in prayer, and initiating a new citywide network of prayer and unity, I was riding high and felt on a daily basis that I was walking closely with God. I could sense his presence with me each day, no matter what kind of work I was doing, whether I was taking one of my long evening prayer walks or working at my restaurant job. 
However, as I entered into this 21 day fast, it felt as though God's hand just lifted off of me. Prayer became so much less enjoyable and I struggled to experience God's presence or hear his voice. Was this normal? In the first week of the fast, I accepted an invitation from John Robb to attend a gathering of New Mexico prayer leaders at the Glorietta Retreat Center in the Pecos Mountains. While there, I found myself in an unfamiliar setting. This was a gathering of prophetic people, quote unquote, who were all hearing from the Lord and sharing what God was saying to them all the time. While I had grown in my respect for charismatics over the past year, this was a bit overwhelming and very strange. I was the youngest person there by at least 20 years. Simply put, these old people were not cool. I found the style of most of them incredibly off-putting. And many of these weird prophetic people were visibly arrogant and puffed up. In my heart, I knew I would rather spend time with my unbelieving friends from college who were interesting, intelligent, and understood me better. After returning from this event and mulling over what I had seen, I heard the Lord speak to me. It was the first time I had heard him clearly during the fast. Do you know why Jesus' prayer in John 17 is not being answered? He asked. No, I answered truthfully. You are the problem. It felt as though an enormous finger landed square upon my chest. Immediately, I knew that I was guilty as charged. Here I am fasting and praying for an answer to Jesus' prayer. Meanwhile, in the midst of that fast, I was judging my brothers and sisters in my heart because they're old, they're weird, they're immature, and they're not cool. To further my guilt, I even loved my unbelieving friends more than my own family, fellow followers of Jesus. This was not what the Lord had taught us to do at all. He told us to love one another as I have loved you. The Lord had put his finger uncomfortably right on the problem. I was the problem. I did not like being rebuked by the Lord. It hurt. I wanted to avoid that rebuke in the future as much as possible. Coming out of this experience, I made a personal commitment to love and honor each and every brother and sister of Christ that I've met, regardless of any other factors. Some of us are weird and some normal, some are old and some young, some are cool and others are anything but. Some are mature and kind, others are immature and puffed up. However, for me, the words of Jesus were ringing, love one another as I have loved you. Clearly, I had fallen far short of that. I despised the very people that Jesus shed his precious blood to purchase. Only if we could love one another as believers would we, would we be able to see Jesus' John 17 prayer answered. And it had to start with me. A strong temptation. As the fast moved forward, it seemed like God was keeping his distance. I persevered in times of prayer and especially in reading the scriptures, but he seemed so far away and everything felt so dry. As this dryness persisted, I began to have a very strong recurring thought. I was beginning to feel I had missed God's best for my life by getting married. After all, Paul says that it's better to remain unmarried so we can serve the Lord wholeheartedly. Could it be that God was calling me to leave my wife and become a traveling monk? going from place to place, preaching the gospel, and living off whatever people gave me, like a modern-day St. Francis of Assisi. The idea was upsetting, but what if it was God? I shared it with my wife, and for obvious reasons, she thought it was a bad idea. I also thought it was a bad idea, but what if it was a God idea, something he wanted me to do, like Abraham putting Isaac on the altar? I had to be ready to make any sacrifice if God wanted me to do it. But still the thought of it troubled and tormented me while also appealing to part of me that wanted to be spiritually extreme and free to roam around without anything holding me down. As the time for the fast, the end of the fast grew nearer, God remained distant. I was no closer to any of my goals and was blaming myself and wondering if I should jump at this wandering monk idea. It was the best next step I had. The net of prayer vision had worked out. Maybe this was the next step. 
I was beginning to get desperate. The entire fast felt like a failure. I felt like a failure. Why was God so far away? Why wouldn't he speak? Everything depended on that. You're back. On the 20th night of the fast, as I prayed, instead of distance, God's presence came back. I literally said out loud, you're back, as I sensed the warm, peaceful presence of God in my prayer time. I sat quietly, crying in relief and listening to him as he began speaking. Put that idea of leaving your wife out of your mind, he said. That idea is not from me. It was not a harsh rebuke, just with gentle, warm, and matter of fact. What a relief it was to hear those words. And what a lesson on what the voice of the enemy sounds and feels like. Years later, I would learn that several famous saints had done exactly what I was tempted to do, left their husbands, wives, and families to pursue a more spiritual path. It seems I was not the first person with zeal for God the enemy has tried to pull that trick on. I continued to hear the Lord. I want you to pray daily for the churches of Santa Fe at the cathedral downtown. There's a special place that I want you to pray. I will show it to you. My prayer time concluded full of sweetness and beauty. God's presence had come back and he had spoken to me again. It wasn't what I was ultimately looking for, but he was back. He had saved me from doing something really and truly stupid, and he was talking with me once again. The next day, I walked to the cathedral downtown. As I arrived, town banners proclaiming the ancient cathedral, the heart of the city, caught my attention. God was bringing me to the heart of the city to pray for the churches of Santa Fe. As I entered the sanctuary, the space was very mixed with a number of syncretistic elements toward the front related to the conquest of Santa Fe. However, as I began to walk toward the back of the building where the congregation sat, I found the place where God wanted me to pray. It was a large baptismal font with running water, large enough for immersion baptisms, but also suitable for sprinkling. The font was artistically made with careful attention to Christian symbolism. God had led me to the perfect prayer place in the very center of the church that was the heart of the city. The cathedral contained much of what was right about the church and much of what was wrong. This was the perfect place to intercede for my churches in the city of Santa Fe. I later learned that the baptismal font I found so special had been created during the charismatic Catholic renewal movement. All right, chapter three, the 10 days vision. A long walk. Anticipation was building for me as I entered the final night of the fast. As the sun was just starting to set, I headed out on what would be a very long and eventful walk. I found I prayed better and heard better when I was walking. At that time, it was normal for me to disappear for an hour or two each night to walk and pray with the Lord. If Adam had cool twilights in the garden, I had late nights in the high desert. As I began to walk, questions came into my mind. What if this doesn't work? What if God doesn't talk to me? Maybe I'll just keep fasting until I find what I'm after, I thought. However, as I began to walk, God began to speak almost right away. I heard this phrase clearly in my spirit. You're someone who goes before someone greater to prepare a way for them. Immediately, I asked the Lord what he meant. Who is this greater one? Am I preparing for the return of Jesus? Or do you mean a younger person who will be greater? Or do you mean the next generation? I heard nothing in response to these questions. But then the Lord began speaking to me about what my ministry would look like, giving me four biblical examples. You'll be like Moses before Joshua, like Jonathan before David, like Elijah before Elisha, and like John the Baptist before Jesus. My mind flooded with thoughts that I'll try to untangle and relate as best I can. One strain of thought was relief, and another was excitement. God was speaking after a long silence. Waiting on God was working. And who knows what he's about to say next. Everything could change in an instant. I always thought what he is saying makes sense of so many other things in my life. With this new understanding of what God had called me to do was an understanding of why I often felt like I didn't fit in. I don't fit in because God has called, made me and called me to do something different. And now I understand more clearly what that is. 
a final thread of thought was more forward looking. It's amazing to know this, but this still doesn't answer my bigger question at all. That question is, God, what do you want me to do? Angels, question mark. And this brings me to a bit of an embarrassing part of the story, but one that see, seems worth sharing for its instructive value. After this initial experience, which lasted about 20 minutes, I heard nothing from the Lord for several hours. The fact is, I was holding out for God to speak to me through an angelic encounter. Part of the motivation, without a doubt, was to see something amazing that would convince both me and others that I had heard from God. No doubt, there were some insecurities and unbelief deep down, mixed with just wanting to hear from God that contributed to these desires. Clearly, I had missed much of the point of Daniel chapter 10. Considering the angel was so ter terrifying, Daniel couldn't move without help. I was so insistent with the Lord on this that I vowed to keep walking and praying until this thing happened, which ended up being about three hours total. By that point, I was wiped out and tired and decided to head home in defeat. I clearly didn't have the staying power to follow through on my overzealous commitments. A little bit of walking around and I was ready to throw in the towel. In hindsight, this is a powerful reminder to me that my spiritual seeming zeal is of so little benefit bereft of the word of God and the grace of God. Finally, in desperation, I removed this requirement from the Lord. Lord, I don't care how you speak to me. I don't need to see an angel. Just tell me what to do. As had happened on my long trek across the country, what began in a powerful encounter had dried up and God seemed distant. However, he was simply waiting for me to get over myself so he could speak words and release vision that would transform and change my life and the lives of people around the globe. As I walked towards home, now open to even the crumbs from God's table, I felt slightly dejected. This hadn't worked out as I'd hoped, and now I was admitting defeat, walking back. Santa Fe is a high desert, a small city of 60,000, surrounded by empty wilderness, and the clear night air was refreshingly cool and dry as I walked. The sky was full of stars, and you could see the Milky Way clearly above. In an open lot to my left sat a couple of concrete handball courts. I sometimes liked to stop there and sing my prayers at night, but this night I was tired and prayed out. As I passed by the courts, I suddenly felt the presence of God and heard a phrase in my spirit. Babylon refuses to mourn. In hindsight, I would ponder how strange and mysterious that phrase was, but in the moment, I did, it did not strike me as strange. However, there was certainly a mystery about it. To be honest, it was like hearing someone talk to you out of the blue when you don't think anyone is around. There was a sense of the nearness of God, but also fear, as if I were in the presence of someone very great and powerful. I was stunned. I stopped walking and turned around as if an actual person were speaking to me, even though I knew I was hearing the words internally. As I stopped, I felt a response rising up from within me, and I answered back to the Lord. But your people will mourn before you return. As I pondered this exchange, it made so much sense to me. If Babylon, the kingdom that opposes God, is characterized in Revelation chapter 18 by a refusal to mourn, resulting in an ultimate judgment when Jesus returns, it made sense that God's people would move in the opposite spirit, that they would mourn while the world rejoiced, and then rejoice when Babylon was mourning. Also, I knew inside, I also I knew inside that this was the moment I had been seeking. After 21 days, I had my audience with the boss. It began to be a very simple, it began to be very simple to speak and hear the Lord. I was able to ask him questions and hear clearly, much like a normal conversation. Lord, what is it that you want me to do? In response, I heard. Call my people to 10 days of fasting, mourning, and repentance from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. Of course, that makes so much sense, I thought. I had studied the feasts, and I knew that the fall feasts of the Lord had special significance prophetically related to the Lord's second coming. After Jesus ascended, the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the day of Pentecost. 
Could it be that these initial fall feasts would be fulfilled by Jesus in a similar way? Whether or not that were true, it made sense to me that if we are getting closer to the Lord's return, he might want his people to be seeking him on these special days that pointed to his second coming. Who is this for, I asked. Is it for Santa Fe? As I asked this question, I heard, no, it's bigger. And in my mind's eye, I saw a map of New Mexico. I began asking and moving out from the city. Is it for New Mexico? No, it's bigger, came the response, and the map zoomed out. Is it for the Southwest? No, it's bigger, and the map zoomed out. With each step zooming out, I became more and more afraid. Eventually, the map was the size of the United States, and I said, stop. And so that part of the vision stopped. I said to myself, what have I gotten myself into? In hindsight, I firmly believe that God was saying this was to be a national and global movement. In the moment of receiving that, I was so afraid that I cut him off. Now, afraid, wondering how I could possibly do something on this scope, I began asking God, how am I supposed to do this? He pointed to my experience in the city of Santa Fe that summer. In my mind's eye, I saw myself driving around the country in my car, talking and sharing with people about this invitation from the Lord to mourn during the 10 days of awe, from the day of trumpets to the day of atonement. This image was very comforting to me. I realized that what seemed very large and out of my control could actually be as simply as simple as simply having conversations one by one with other believers as I had done in setting up the Santa Fe prayer net. With the comfort of this understanding, my interior vision shifted to a city that was covered in the glory of God. I knew that the people of this city had shut down the activity of normal life and had stopped everything in order to worship, pray, fast, and seek the Lord. Businesses were closed, schools were closed, shopping centers were closed, even churches were empty as the people of the city gathered together to seek God together. It was as though a city on earth had become a perfect representation of the throne room in heaven described in Revelation chapters four to five. The city was completely covered in what seemed to be a thick golden cloud that surrounded the city like the glass and interior liquids surround a snow globe. The presence of God was so thick, it was difficult to see through. I knew this city would never be the same. As I saw this city, two questions bubbled up from within me. God, how would you respond if a city sought you in this way? The second question was, is this how you want to answer Jesus' prayer in John 17? By this point, I had completed my walk and returned to my home. Although we shared the living space with other people, it was late enough at that point that no one was awake and the lights were all off. While God had seemed distant, so distant for weeks, and it had been so hard to hear anything from God, all of a sudden, I found that I couldn't turn the faucet off. God kept speaking as I sat down on the couch in the dark and continued to converse with him. You're also going to pray for 10 days leading up to Pentecost this year, I heard him say. At this point, my inner, sir, my inner sense of the absurd was breached. Lord, I don't think anyone is going to believe me or listen to me as it is. I don't think anyone will stop everything for 10 days once a year, much less two times a year. God, this is too much 10 days. Of course, this isn't what the Lord said but rather he had given me a specific instruction for that year, 2005. However, at the time, I was feeling all kinds of emotions at once. Fear and fright, excitement, joy, fear again, bafflement, confusion, joy again, and all of this swimming in an ongoing and powerful sense of God's presence. As we continued our conversation that night, God spoke to me about a number of other things. Unfortunately, at the time, the experience was so intense that I thought there was no way I could ever forget anything that happened. I didn't even write it down that night, although I would do a lot of writing about it over the next months. Now, I realized that writing it down is an important part of stewarding what God speaks to you, but because I'd never been trained, I didn't know. Some of the further details of what happened, I can no longer remember. Thankfully, the major points are just as strong today as they were that night in 2004. 
As I came to bed, I was elated. I shared briefly with Cassie that God had spoken to me as I went to bed. One way or another, I understood that what had just happened would change everything about my life going forward. As I fell asleep, questions lingered in my mind. What will life be like tomorrow? What kind of person will I be? And most pressingly, what have I gotten myself into? Don't read too much of it, then you won't buy it. There That's right. No, we're right. Still, we got we're, it. We're, we're still, still buying it. On YouTube, yeah. <laughs> we're we're still buying it. <laughs> we'll yeah. still buy it. Amen. Yeah, yeah, yeah we got to do that change. teaser. We got to just That's tease right. it. Not, uh, yeah. That's right. But that that is a longer version of how <laughs> I got the vision for 10 days. Um, and, um, you know, obviously I can't normally share some of those details. Um, but the reason I'm sharing some of those details like that are, you know, for instance, my reaction to um, older prophetic people that were immature, uh, you know, just like how much that bothered me. The reason I'm sharing that is that that's stuff that a lot of people struggle with. And so it's, it's more just not just so people get the vision of 10 days and want to do 10 days but also pastorally so we can address those things in our own hearts. Um, and so that's one of the major purposes of the book, not to ruin any more of it, but um, there comes a point in the book right now, it's my favorite part um, where I'm experiencing burnout after experiencing personal revival. And as I'm trying to understand it, I start reading Jonathan Edwards, who led the first Great Awakening. And Edwards was a massive champion of the revival, but he also wrote about what he called the excesses and errors of the revival. And he highlights about 12 different things in that chapter. Uh, as it turned out, I had done all 12 things that he highlights as errors and excesses. I had done them repeatedly and habitually. Um, and so when I read that, I realized, oh my gosh, what I've gone through is not unique. In fact, if I had just read Edwards before doing this and, and been able to hear him, I could have avoided all of this entirely. Um, so anyway, there's like things like that in there. Um, and then it'll just be also just kind of a sense of like the whole story of how we got to this point, uh, which is amazing. Right. Um, and I think too, like realizing this isn't like a, a glossy, um, bump, bump free journey. This is, um, a real journey that we've gone through. And now really God is giving incredible favor. Um, but this is how it happened. And, in our own lives, like that's what God wants to do with, with each and every one of us. You know, there are, <laughs> he's going to bring us through our immaturity. Um, he's going to, you know, make incredible promises to us and then begin to fulfill them. And that's some, that's his consistent pattern throughout all of scripture. Um, and so I, I want that to be just an encouragement. Um, and uh, anyway, so Yep, I will we'll we'll share more about the book uh during 10 days Pentecost, but I just thought that'd be a fun way to um share the 10 days vision today and also a good step for me to take. I was more nervous than I would normally be sharing because it's my first time sharing it. So anyway, Nancy. Yes, sir. I'm just curious. Did Global Family come after 10 days? It did. It did. Okay. Yeah. Um, global family. Just came one out. more thing. One more yep. thing. I feel so much better about my failures now. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Probably didn't, haven't done half the stupid things I've done, Nancy. So, um, global family actually really cool story just to, to share. Um, Liz, Liz came to me in 2019 and was like, what if we did a 10 days of prayer on zoom. And I was like, well, I don't think it probably would be that good. Um, because I hate praying on zoom. 
And I hate being on Zoom in general. Like if I could not be on Zoom ever, that would be great. Um, and, but one of the things I've learned is um, when people have an idea, don't like crush it. <laughs> and uh, Liz herself had doubts about whether it would work. And I was just like, yeah, I don't know if it's going to be any good, but we should try it. And Liz moved forward. Liz, this is my version. You can tell your version later. Um, this is the, the, uh, the passion translation of the, of the global family story. Uh, so Liz had this idea and then Jason came on board. And I just remember it was me, Liz, Jason, and it could have been Jenny, Lisa. I can't remember everyone else who was on the call. Maybe it were four or five, six of us. And um, I remember I was at my parents' house in St. Louis when we had the conversation. And Jason shared, um, let's do this 10 days thing. And then he started to share how he had vision for not just one 24 seven prayer room on Zoom, but actually for many. And when he shared that, like the presence of God just hit me. Uh, I knew that I needed to help Jason uh, start this 24 seven prayer room online. And I was really excited that our Zoom 10 days could be used to do something greater. Like I, that to me, it was just all a value add and the real value add was being able to help Jason do something that he felt called to do. Now, I did not realize I would be helping as much. Let me just say that right now. I thought we would help by doing 10 days and then Jason would um, you know, run this 24 seven house of prayer online. Um, and so we did 10 days in 2019. Uh, the amazing thing about it was that it worked. And when we heard people's testimonies afterwards, we recognized they had had what I would just call a 10 days experience. Like what I mean by that is it sounded like people who'd done 10 days that I've been listening to for many years. I was like, wow, these people got touched by God. There were signs and wonders. There were miracles in people's lives. Everyone had testimonies. Everyone was crying. There was John 17 unity. I was like, wow, that really worked. And then so that was a revelation. I was like, well, hey, I'm glad I didn't like go with my gut instinct on like what would be right. I'm glad I didn't listen to that. Um, <laughs> that was that was good. Um, and then in 2020, um, we had planned to do 10 days Pentecost on Zoom. And I was struggling to find we were planning to do a summit um, like we did this year in Dubai. And I love the summit. Summits are one of our my favorite things that we do because it's not that long, it's short, but it's really impactful. Uh, so it's like in a week, I feel like there's so much value uh, out of a summit and there's more teaching. I like teaching, it's fun. Um, and God was like, in January, he spoke to me. He said, uh, it's okay if you don't do a summit this year. And he said, in fact, don't do anything this year that you've done in the past because there's gonna be a totally new pattern this year. Man, am I glad I listened to that. That was helpful. Thank you, Lord. Uh, Cause there was a whole new pattern. And at that point I looked at our 10 days Pentecost Zoom event that we had scheduled and I said, this will just take the place of our summit, this Zoom event. Um, and we'll do teaching during that 24 seven prayer time. And anyway, the pandemic hit two months later and we saw just a real explosion of people joining in online prayer uh, in the spring of 2020 that carried over into the fall of 2020. In the fall of 2020, Jason and I talked and we just said, okay, we think we have enough leadership right now through these different 10 day gatherings that we could see a 24 seven prayer room being sustained. And we had that conversation during the 10 days, the fall 10 days, we settled on a name. I was actually uh, in uh, downtown Boston on the common when we had this conversation. And uh, we came up with the name Global Family. We were inspired by that IHOP KC word about the international family of affection. 
But we said to each other, we said, dude, we see the global family coming together. Like we can just see it. So we should call the prayer room global family. Um, and that's how we got here. So anyway, just a little story on that since I'm in story mode. So, 